Good afternoon and welcome to today's lightning webinar. My name is Laura Roberts and I'm a coordinator at the American Indian Cancer Foundation. Before we begin, I have a few things to review with you. Today's webinar is in recognition of Cervical Cancer Awareness Month and will be about 15 minutes long. Due to the short duration of the webinar and to respect your time, there is no time allotted for questions. If you do have any questions, I encourage you to type them into the chat box if you are watching with us on Zoom. You can open the chat box by clicking the chat icon on the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you're watching on Facebook, either live or the replay, you can feel free to post a comment or you can send an email to health at AICAF.org and we will send a follow-up email answering the questions. For those who registered and attended today's webinar, you will be entered into a drawing for our water bottle. The winner will be announced tomorrow via email and Facebook. After today's webinar, you will receive an evaluation in your email inbox from Robert Spencer, ACAP's evaluation coordinator. If you do not see the link in your inbox, please check your snap <coughs> folder. The link to the evaluation is also conveniently located in the Zoom chat box. The evaluation will only take two minutes to complete. If you complete it by the end of the day, you will have a bonus entry in today's water bottle giveaway. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Amanda Briegel. Dr. Briegel is from the Oneida and Stockbridge Muncie tribes, and she works as a gynecologic oncologist at the Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Briegel specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of gynecologic cancers. Thank you, Dr. Briegel, and feel free to start when you are ready. Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's Lightning webinar. Uh, today is a follow-up to our last webinar, um, talking about pap smears. And we're going to talk about what happens when your pap smear is abnormal. What do we do next? <clears throat> so first of all, don't panic. An abnormal pap smear does not equal a cancer diagnosis. An abnormal pap smear does not mean you need a hysterectomy. What an, an abnormal pap smear means is that you and your provider need to evaluate further and develop a treatment plan. So briefly, just to review concepts from last week, um, and if you're unable to join us, uh, this will be a, a crash course in pap smears and how often you need them. In general, at less than age 21, no cervical pap smear screening is necessary. Beginning at age 21 to 29, occurring every three years, a pap smear only is performed. At the ages of 30 to 65, we begin to have a couple different options. The preferred method in the United States right now is to have HPV testing, a virus known to cause cervical cancer, and then pap smear or cytology co-testing every five years. Acceptable alternatives are to do cytology only um, every three years or HPV testing only every three years. At age greater than 65, no screening is required unless you have a history of moderate or severe precancer or, <clears throat> sorry, moderate or severe precancer or a diagnosis of cancer. In that case, you need to have additional screening for 20 years following that diagnosis. So for example, if you had moderate or severe precancer at 55, you would need to continue with routine pap smear screening until the age of 75. So a little bit about pap smear screening. Uh, many of us have been in this position before. You can see in the upper left corner is a woman on an exam bed with her legs in lithotomy position or stirrups. A speculum, either metal or plastic, is placed into the vagina and the cervix is visualized. You can see on the image on the right that here is a picture of a cervix. And what we do when we take a pap smear is we use a brush to exfoliate cells off the surface of the cervix. So here's an example of some of the results that you may get and to help you decipher what that means. <clears throat> so NILM is a very common designation for a normal pap smear. What it means in doctor lingo is negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy. It means that the cytologist who is reading your pap smear under the microscope did not see anything that was consistent with concern. You can see a picture on the right. These look like little pink and blue fried eggs. The part in the center is the nucleus. That's where DNA changes happen in the cell. And then essentially the, the equivalent of the yolk um, is, uh, you can see there's a high volume of, um, of the white part of the egg to the yolk. Um, follow up for a normal pap smear is routine screening. So if you're in that younger age group, you'd have another pap smear in three years. If you're in the group that has HPV co-testing, um, routine follow up would be in about five years. The most mild version of abnormal is ASCUS or atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance. 
So what this means in English is that the cells don't look horribly abnormal, but just abnormal enough to raise the suspicion that something else could be going on. You can see a picture to the right um, of, of a cell, and it's, it's fairly bland. Um, and if you're not feeling like you're a pathologist at that point, don't worry, these people are experts and they will read these things for you. So the thing about ASCUS is that one third to two thirds of these results are actually not due to any HPV related changes, no cancerous changes in the cell. Um, recent intercourse, recent infection with bacterial vaginosis, sexually transmitted infections such as gonorrhea or chlamydia, they can all cause inflammation and mild changes. And so most of these actually are not due to something concerning. <clears throat> HPV testing is really helpful in triaging the meaning of an ASCUS pap smear. So if HPV is negative, you can do a co-test again in three years. So slightly earlier than the five years, um, but not, not so um, aggressive of a follow-up as it used to be in prior years. If there is HPV testing uh, that's done and it does show presence of a high-risk HPV subtype, clinical recommendations are typically to perform colposcopy, and we'll outline what this is in a few slides. Um, and then something called endocervical curatage, if there's something that we can't see. Additional pap smear results. So on the left, there's LSIL, so low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. So this means that there are more abnormalities that are identified by the pathologist, but they're low-grade in nature, as opposed to the slide on the right, which is high-grade, so high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. Now, when you look at the slides and the pictures, um, comparing the left versus the right, you can see that the stuff in the center um, on the right, it's much more purple and dark, and it's a little bit bigger. So the ratio of the, the dark purple stuff to the sort of light pinkish stuff um, is increased, whereas on the left, you see a little bit more enhancement of the purple, but you still see a fair amount of the, the white part of the egg, as, the, as it were. Additionally, atypical glandular cells can be seen on a pap smear. Um, so this, this can be coming from up inside the uterus and actually the uterine lining, or it can be coming from um, the, the opening of the cervix or the cervical canal. Typically, if you have um, a low-grade lesion or worse, the reflexive next step in your clinical care is something called colposcopy. I find that this can be a very frightening, intimidating uh, procedure for patients um, who've never had one before. So what happens is uh, a patient comes in, um, and similar to um, uh, the, the pap smear, you're placed in that lithotomy position, so your legs are in stirrups. Just like when you had your pap smear, you have a speculum placed inside the vagina to help visualize the cervix. Um, a colposcope is like binoculars for the cervix, okay? No part of that instrument actually goes inside your body. So when you see that, when you walk in the room, don't panic, nothing is going inside. Um, what it does is help really magnify the surface of the cervix so we can take a closer look. One thing we do to help us really highlight the changes is we apply something called acetic acid, which is actually vinegar, and we apply that to the cervix. So using either a gauze soaked with vinegar or some um, large Q-tips with vinegar, we place that on the cervix and the upper vagina, and we let that sit for about two minutes. What happens with this solution is it actually changes some of the cells that are being impacted by HPV, and it turns them a white color. So then when we apply the, the, our eyes and look at the um, binoculars, through the binoculars at your cervix, we can see some distinct changes that help us kind of determine our level of suspicion or concern. So here is some images of what you can see. So on the left is an example of normal colposcopy. So the patient had, um, uh, I'm gonna see, hopefully you guys can see the arrow here. So this is the normal part of the cervix and that's squamous cells. And then there's the glandular portion of the cervix um, here. And where those two different cell types meet, you see this nice white line. We call that the transition zone. And that's a really important part for determining if the colposcopy is adequate. Did you see enough of the normal tissue to ensure that you're seeing everything that's important? And so a little bit of white at this interface is very, very normal. If you look at the uh, image on the right, you can see there is a lot more white and there's more blood vessels. So this is something that if I saw it, I would be suspicious that there is um, uh, moderate or severe precancer, and I would want to take a biopsy of several of these areas to get a better idea of how to make my next steps. 
So possible biopsy results. So on the left is sort of the pathology description. In the middle is a clinical uh, translation. And on the right is some typical management. Now these aren't one size fits all management. Um, and based on your age, risk factors, and prior PAP history, you and your provider may make a slightly different plan. So for the path description on the top, CIN1, that essentially is very mildly abnormal, and the management is observation. For most people, this will um, resolve on its own. Um, our immune systems will clear the HPV virus um, within about two years for most of us. And so we really want to allow our bodies the time for that to happen. And so sometimes you need more frequent pap smears or another colposcopy procedure to make sure things aren't progressing in a way that we do not want it to have. The next pathologic description is CI. N2. And this is moderate dysplasia. And depending on your age, your fertility desires, um, and other risk factors, you could observe versus proceeding with an excisional procedure. So a large biopsy of the cervix to essentially remove the things that are visibly abnormal. CIN3 is severe dysplasia or severe precancer. This is more worrisome as sometimes cervical cancer can coexist with these sorts of lesions and abnormalities. And so typically most of us will proceed with some sort of excisional procedure or large biopsy of the abnormal tissue in the operating room or in the office to help uh, reduce the risk of this progressing. Additionally, you can also have an invasive cancer um, that can be found. Um, the clinical translation is an invasive cancer. And there are multiple options depending on what the stage of disease is, the patient's age, the desire to maintain fertility, if at all possible. For an invasive cancer diagnosis, I would recommend referral to a gynecologic oncologist, a specialist within the field of OBGYN that treats only cancer. So here are some pictures that show the two different large biopsy types that you can do to remove cervical precancer. On the left is an example of what's called a LEAP. This is an office-based procedure where, again, you're in the lithotomy position, so your legs are in the stirrups. The provider will do an um, extensive injection um, to numb the cervix and to make you feel as comfortable as possible. And using a special um, electrocautery instrument, you remove the entire area that was abnormal and white. So on that first picture that we saw, that extensive area of white, we would remove all of that with this special electrocautery instrument. That is then sent to the pathologist to fully evaluate. And things that we look at when the pathologist brings it back to us is, are the margins negative for the precancer? We wanna feel good that we've gotten all of the abnormal um, and we tailor our management strategy afterwards according to that. On the right is the procedure that I typically perform. This is called a cold, cold knife conization. This is done in the operating room. It's a similar position of the patient. Um, but instead of using heat, um, you use a scalpel um, to remove uh, essentially a cone-shaped section of the cervix. Um, both are completely acceptable for the treatment of precancer um, in patients with abnormal pap smears. One thing to note, as uh, precancers do tend to happen in the young patient population, is that cold knife cone and leap may impact future pregnancy. And it's important that anyone who has had this procedure um, at the beginning of a new pregnancy does discuss this with their provider. Um, what happens is, is when we remove this portion of the cervix, it then decreases sort of the um, strong tissue and potentially the length of the cervix. If the cervix is significantly shortened um, prior to pregnancy, it can increase the risk for preterm labor or preterm birth. Some providers will do additional ultrasounds to look at the length of the cervix during pregnancy, as there are interventions that can be done to help reduce the risk of a, of a preterm delivery. So what I recommend for providers is um, at the time a viable pregnancy is identified, um, discuss with the patient um, and try to get as much information as you can. Um, consider a referral to MFM, which is a perinatologist or maternal fetal medicine doctor or OB for consult. Um, if you are going to look at the cervical length during pregnancy, a very common time is at 16 to 18 weeks. Based on the length of the cervix at that time, they may consider to provide, provide uh, vaginal estrogen, I mean vaginal progesterone, um, to help decrease the risk of preterm delivery. Thank you, Dr. Briegel, for sharing this valuable information. I would like to thank all of you for attending today's webinar in partnership with the American Indian Cancer Foundation and Dr. Amanda Briegel.
please contact us at the American Indian Cancer Foundation by emailing health at aicaf.org if you have any further questions. Be on the lookup be on the lookout for a follow-up email, slides available in PDF format, along with a link to today's recording. In addition, an email from Robert Spencer has been sent to your inbox and includes a brief survey that we would greatly appreciate you fill out to give us feedback about today's webinar and format. Thank you.